maybe uh, Jeff will will draw a picture of you <laughs> to put in the. <laughs> Lesson, don't sit next to Seth. That's a, should I correct him on the daylight savings time or just let him sit there and s <laughs> stew in it? Mr. Smart Alec. Uh, fall back, we actually get an extra hour of sleep next Sunday. <laughs> let us close in prayer. <laughs> Oh, uh, it was great to hear uh, Dr. Bill this morning um, when Cindy and I were first attending uh, Believer's Chapel. He was a few years ahead of me, and uh, he was quite bold in uh, our Lord's Supper meetings in the evening. We'd get to, uh, I see Frank here too, Dan, of course, uh, so many of these young men were bold and standing up and teaching and, and sharing, and I remember being quite impressed. And of course, he's had, the Lord has used him uh, in a great way over the years. So really nice to have him come back and, and be with us. We thank him for that. Well, uh, Warren mentioned it, it's October 31st. It is uh, Reformation uh, Sunday. And uh, that's because on October 31st, 1517, a, a frustrated monk named Martin Luther, uh, nailed upon the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, the 95 theses he had penned in opposition to the established Roman church's teachings on a variety of subjects, but mainly on how a person uh, can be saved. It marked the beginning of the reformation of the church and was a watershed moment in the history of the civilized world. I want to say a bit this morning uh, about Luther and his contributions to uh, the new movement, but it will be by necessity only a brief sketch uh, before we look in a little more detail at one scripture passage that reinforces Luther's fierce belief that a person can only be justified before God by faith, and that faith itself comes to a person only as the free gift of God. And there are many passages, as you know, that we could read to reinforce that. But the passage I've chosen is the familiar nighttime interview between Jesus and Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel. We won't have time to read and study this account in, in great detail, but I'm interested mostly this morning in what the Lord says about the role of the Holy Spirit in the new birth. So let's begin reading, if you have your Bibles, uh, John chapter 2, actually, uh, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, and said to him, truly, truly, and you know that's the mark that Jesus is going to say something that he considers to be especially important. Amen, amen. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. 
The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? May the Lord bless this reading of his word. Will you bow together with me in prayer? Martin Luther's legacy is too great to summarize in the introduction to a sermon. He's not only a pillar of the church whose influence has endured and influenced the world of faith in every generation since, but whose contributions to secular thought are significant as well. His story has been told from this pulpit uh, multiple times over the years. Born in 1483 in Saxony, he grew up in his native land as a highly intelligent boy, uh, eventually renowned for his mastery of debate and philosophical studies. But at an early age, uh, circumstances in his life combined to make him unusually troubled over the state of his soul. He resorted to the only resource known to him, to the teachings and ministrations of the church, and so he hastened to lay hold of every help the church had to offer, sacraments, uh, pilgrimages, indulgences, and the other practices created by the church to, to give one peace. But he failed to find peace. Uh, finally, there was arranged for him a trip to Rome, uh, the center of the Roman church's theological and organizational resources and the repository of all its wealth on display everywhere one looked in its architecture and art, its pomp and circumstance. But he failed to find peace there too. Uh, Rome's treasures held no appeal to Luther and the labyrinthine organization of the church, corrupted by worldliness, yet purporting to be the representation of the body of Christ on earth, left him disgusted and confused. But he continued on the course of his studies and still determined to discover the answer to the question that tormented his soul. How could a sinner be received by a holy God? As he advanced scholastically, he obtained a doctorate and eventually ascended to the chair of theology at the University of Wittenberg. In 1513, uh, he began lecturing on the Psalms, and during that period, his focus turned to the topic that continued to vex him, uh, the righteousness of God and the problem that sin posed to a person's ability to have a relationship with this righteous God. And from the Psalms, his lectures shifted to Paul's epistle to the Romans. In a short time, Luther had discovered what would become his doctrine of justification by faith alone. He discovered that the righteousness of God is a gift, not a merit one could obtain on one's own, but solely the outcome of the mediatorial work of Christ on the cross. And he became convinced of the true nature of faith, that it too was a gift bestowed purely by the grace of God and nothing that a sinful person could conjure up through his own ability. He didn't learn these things through the church, but through the scriptures. Uh, such passages as Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that it's by grace that we're saved through faith, and that, that, that package of grace and faith is not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. He learned it from passages such as John 6, uh, 37 and 44, where Jesus spoke of the total inability of sinful man apart from the intervening grace of God Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no wise uh, cast out. But then he added, no one can come to me unless 
The Father who sent me draws him, and, and then no one can come to me unless it has been given to him by the Father. Luther wrote of these things. He was a prolific writer, and his writings led to trouble. He was asked by the church to recant of his writings at the Diet of Worms, and with great disturbance of soul, he refused you can tell I'm speeding through this a bit, but uh, he was secretly rescued and, and lived for a period of time in Wartburg, but eventually made his way back to Wittenberg and reestablished his leadership of the church there in Wittenberg. But while in Wittenberg, Luther's enemies continued to oppose him, the great humanist Desiderius uh, Erasmus, many of you read him in your uh, college history classes, I did. Uh, Erasmus was a man of unsurpassed learning and a friend of the Roman church, and he had at first supported uh, Luther because he too wished to see the church reformed. But Erasmus failed to see how it had to come through a return to the actual truths of grace, faith, and salvation as found in the New Testament. But as Luther's teachings gained broad traction, eventually Erasmus and his cohorts opposed him, and Erasmus wrote his famous book against Luther entitled On the Freedom of the Will. Among other things, Erasmus emphasized the importance of the good works a person could perform by his own free will, Apart from divine aid, in response, uh, Luther uh, penned his, his magnum opus, uh, The Famous Bondage of the Will. It's an excellent book. Uh, many of you have read it. It makes for very lively reading. There's an edition available that has a, a preface by J.I. Packer and O.R. Johnston. Uh, the work is, is deeply steeped in Scripture and, and consequently makes a repeated and passionate argument for the doctrines of God's overall sovereignty over all things and of man's salvation sourced so, solely in His grace. And in that book, he takes dead aim at free will. He doesn't argue that man has not a kind of freedom of the will. Of course, a person's will is spontaneous to each one, but it was man's total inability to save himself and the absolute sovereignty of divine grace in salvation that Luther was affirming when he opposed free will. The free will he took aim at was the free will in question in relation to God and the things of God. Erasmus had argued for the freedom of the will, Luther for the bondage of the will. So Luther gave Erasmus credit for identifying uh, the central point at issue, the very nature of our wills, the very nature of the human will. Uh, Luther didn't argue that man through sin had ceased to be man or man and, and woman, uh, only that man through sin had ceased to be good. Indeed, that he was totally unable to do good. It was a truth which would later be labeled total depravity, the idea that sin has corrupted uh, human beings in whole, affecting everything that makes a person a person, including our volition. Every individual makes free choices. The only thing is, because of sin, the ability to choose the great and good things, the things pleasing to God, has been lost. Luther followed Augustine, who believed that only when a person has been changed from the outside, that is, by God, will good works follow. And once that is admitted, the inability of man, apart from God's grace, becomes evident. Scripture bears witness to it, especially in the Apostle Paul's writings. In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, Paul stated it plainly, the natural man, that is any human being who has not received the illuminating grace of God, 
does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. Cannot. That's inability. In Romans chapter 8, verse 6, the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's inability. And of course, Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, writing of how a person can be delivered from his depravity and inability, states much the same thing. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Paul repeatedly describes a person who has not received the life-giving ministry of the Holy Spirit as dead. Dead people. Dead people are unable to do what the living can do. And it is God, and only God, who can make us alive. We call that conversion, when a person has been converted from death to life. And saving faith is the instrumentation God uses to effect that conversion. It's what Paul meant when he wrote in Ephesians 2, that it's by grace that you're saved through faith. So where does faith or belief uh, come from? And here we come to our, our gospel uh, passage. Uh, John's gospel helps us answer that question. Uh, one of the major themes of the gospel of John is believing or belief. Uh, the word belief or believe occurs almost 90 times in the, the gospel of John. But you also notice as you read along in that gospel, that there are many occasions in which G John describes people as believing in Jesus, but their belief proves to be inadequate or spurious or superficial. It doesn't last because it is not real. Its foundation is totally unstable. Uh, true faith is a sovereign work of God in the hearts of men, and it is elicited as he acts to first give them new birth and then reveal himself to them through his word. The opposite of what Dr. Bill was uh, speaking of out of Isaiah chapter 6. And nowhere is that great truth stated so clearly as in our passage uh, this morning when Nicodemus the Jewish leader, comes to the Lord by night seeking an answer to the vexing question, and the Lord abruptly informs him that unless he is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The most famous interview in history, full of, of spiritual truth, teasingly uh, brief in its description, and ending wonderfully in chapter 19 with the appearance of Nicodemus at Jesus' death. Now a true believer, daring to approach Pilate to seek a proper burial for his Lord. Well, we must view it in the context that John provides. So we begin at the end of chapter 2. Word about Jesus and the signs that he had performed spread rapidly, and a nation thirsty for hope and delivery from Roman subjugation was eager to find a hero who might prove to be the promised deliverer. Many of the Jews then, John states in verse 23, were observing the signs that Jesus was doing, and they were believing in him. But Jesus' knowledge of man's hearts is complete, and he knew 
a counterfeit faith when he saw it. Uh, John uses a play on words here to express that. Now, you'll like it if, if you look at it, but he, he states in verse 24 that Jesus was not entrusting himself to them. But that's the same word as is translated believed in verse 23. They believed in him, but he didn't believe in them. They trusted in him, but he didn't trust himself to them. Uh, so here is the Lord God himself in the person of his son, infallibly searching the hearts of these professors of belief, and he was unwilling to accept their profession, for he knew its spurious character. John says he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. Nicodemus is an example of the insufficient faith just described. And John will use Jesus' words to him to draw the contrast between what man is capable of capable of, in and of himself, and the work of the Holy Spirit of God. We're familiar uh, with Nicodemus. His appearance is the prelude to the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. Uh, John describes him briefly as a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews. He comes across, at least to me, as somewhat awkward but he has a curious spirit and doesn't set about to impulsively oppose the Lord like most of the Jewish leaders who appear. Uh, rather, he seems to have a genuine respect for him and a desire uh, to, to know more. He acknowledges him as rabbi uh, and a great teacher at that. As has been said, he thought well of Christ, but not well enough. And that surely had much to do with his background. He was a Pharisee. They were the conservatives as far as the religious traditions of the Jews in opposition to the Sadducees who had become rationalists, materialists, rejecting the spirit world, the very idea of resurrection or spiritual life. The Pharisees held to these ideas, but in their zeal against the secularism of their Hellenistic world, they turned inward and externalized their faith, turning it into a works-oriented path to salvation. And John tells us in verse 2 that this man, for that was what he was, an illustration of the frailty and weakness inherent in sinful man apart from the grace of God, this man came to Jesus by night. Perhaps he went by night out of a concern for, for secrecy because he didn't want anyone to know of his, of his visit. But if we consider how John uses that word night in other places, for example, uh, when reporting Judas's departure from the upper room in chapter 13, uh, craftily there adding, and it was night, we may infer that John wants us to understand night to be a picture of spiritual darkness. Uh, Nicodemus' own night was darker than he knew, and he came now into the presence of true light. There's an indication of that in how he begins. Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus has this recognition that God is somehow with Jesus, as perhaps he was with some of the Old Testament saints of old. I'm not sure we can say for sure where Nicodemus was heading with his uh, clumsy approach to the Lord, but uh, judging by Jesus' sudden remark to him in verse 3, the implied question, uh, you know, what he was going to ask was either, who, who, who are you? Uh, where did you come from? Or, or something like, uh, tell me how I can attain to uh, what every pious Jew longs for, the certainty that I will be 
a part of the, that great company of people who will live with God forever after I die, huh? how will I be able to experience the kingdom of God? Very profound question, yet in our daily lives, so many think at all about it. But Nicodemus was not like that. He had a curiosity about the things of God and was not content to remain ignorant about them. But whatever the question he was about to ask, Jesus abruptly uh, cut him off in order to direct his attention to the most important matter, his complete inadequacy before God. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What Nicodemus needed to know and what Jesus was at pains to inform him which is why he prefaced it with that emphatic, truly, truly, I say to you, was that before he could consider any kind of communion or right relationship with God, for now or for eternity, there would have to take place a radical transformation within himself. What he was pondering was not the stuff of theological debate between two gifted men, uh, Jesus was telling this great teacher that he was totally unqualified to sort out the great truths of God and of heaven. Nicodemus thought he was on a level with Jesus, that they were two great teachers and that perhaps this new teacher could maybe confirm him in his ideas about working his way to the kingdom and enjoying the fruit of all that his life up to that point had entailed this great teacher of Israel. But as Leon Morris observed, in one sentence, Jesus sweeps away all that Nicodemus stood for and demands that he be remade by the power of God. Jesus said, unless unless one is born again. And then he'll tell him that he must be born again. It, it points to a situation, the solution to which is necessary if he is to escape from where he is. Unless I have a ticket, I cannot get into the game. Unless ha I have water, I cannot live. What Jesus was saying to him was that was, he was in a condition insufficient to get him what he desired. You are in a condition insufficient to get what you desire. Jesus knew what was in man, and he knew it was insufficient. More than that, what was in man actually disqualified him. Because what man is, is a sinner. And sinners cannot see the kingdom of God. Men and women, apart from a new birth, are under the judgment of God for our sin. And we cannot stand before him as we are. And there is nothing on earth that we can do to improve our status before him. No matter how good a person that you think you might be, no matter to what level of religious importance you have obtained. You have fallen short of the glory of God, and if you reject faith in Jesus and in his word, then you have rejected the only path to the kingdom that is available to you, and you stand under God's judgment. So here, Jesus is telling a respected leader of the Jews that unless he is born, and that's the word he uses, to, to be begotten, unless he is generated again, or as the word means literally, from above, unless he's generated from above, he cannot see God's promised kingdom. That word anothan can be translated either from above or again. And you can tell by Nicodemus' response in verse 4, that however he intended it, he recognized that it was a second birth Jesus meant. Uh, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? 
He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? We can only guess the tone behind Nicodemus's retort. Was it one of confusion or, or irritation or just maybe the give and take of a, a serious discussion? But it's clear he understood what Jesus was saying to be a second birth, and he did not understand that at all. So Jesus explains in, in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. What the Lord's doing is explaining to Nicodemus the nature of the new birth, or the nature of regeneration. In verses 7 and 8, he will address the source of regeneration. But here he speaks of its nature. And there have been a number of interpretations of this phrase, born of water and the spirit. It is confusing on the surface, or at least it always has been to me. Uh, some saying that water is a reference to baptism or even to the water of childbirth. Uh, Time won't allow us to examine all the different views. But the important thing to observe, if you notice nothing else here, is that it is Jesus' explanation of what it means to be born from above. It's Jesus' explanation of what it means to be born from above. He said in verse 3 that unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And now he says that unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. So he's identifying them. Uh, being born from above is being born of water and spirit. The phrase reads literally born of water and spirit, not of water and of spirit. And I'm not being nitpicky here, but the, the preposition of only appears one time, reinforcing the idea that Jesus was shedding more light on what born from above means. Only one birth is in view, only one act, and it is one that involves both water and spirit. Now, in verse 10, let your eye wander down there. Jesus is going to rebuke Nicodemus for not understanding this already. He asked him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? The implication is, I'm sure you've heard before, that Nicodemus was not just a teacher. He was a very influential teacher, perhaps the supreme rabbi of the day. He was the teacher of Israel. And what of all things ought the teacher of Israel have been conversing in? The scriptures. Jesus is admonishing him because the concept of being born from above and of water and spirit was a scriptural concept. And so we should look to the scriptures to find Jesus' meaning. Don Carson was, uh, for many years, professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and he provides great insight here in his commentary. To, to the Jews, water meant preeminently not childbirth, not baptism, but cleansing. Cleansing. So we ought to look to the scriptures to find where the two ideas merge in order to discover the Lord's meaning. The Spirit, uh, first, is, is constantly spoken of as God's principle of life, beginning in creation, but also in bringing life throughout history upon sinful humanity so that they are renewed to a righteous standing before God as He pours His Spirit upon them. And then when water is used, especially in conjunction with God's Spirit, it habitually refers to renewal or cleansing. And there are a number of, of scripture references that show that. But the most important example is found in Ezekiel 36, that chapter which prophesies the new covenant. 
where in verse 25 of Ezekiel 36, the Lord speaks of how he will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a a heart of flesh. He goes on to say in verse 27 of Ezekiel 36, I will put my spirit within you and, and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So that's chapter 36. And then, as Carson notes, it's, it's no accident that the account of the Valley of Dry Bones where Ezekiel preaches that, and the Spirit gives life to these dry bones, follows hard after Ezekiel's water spirit uh, passage in the, in the very next chapter. Nicodemus, of all people, should have understood from Ezekiel and, and other passages that what God promised to his people was a new experience that transcended their mortal, sinful life and replaced it with the cleansing of repentance and the life-giving transformation of the Spirit of God. So Jesus tells them in verse 6 now, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's the first birth, uh, the birth into sin and judgment. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And that's the, the new birth, the birth that gains entry into the kingdom of God. One does not necessarily lead to uh, the other. One doesn't necessarily lead to the other. This is the new birth. The first birth is diametrically opposed to the new birth. And Nicodemus should have known that. He should have known that from his understanding of the scriptures, from his observation over the years of how far removed man is from God's holiness. He should have known that in order to ever live in God's presence for a moment or for eternity, a person would need, well, he would need what God had so long ago promised. He'd need a new heart, a new nature, a new ability. Every sinner is in the same shoes as Nicodemus. We need a new heart. We must be born again. But where does such a thing come from? Can we buy it? Can we earn it? Uh, that was Luther's question. Uh, and Jesus gives the answer now in verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, we lose a bit in translation here because we, we use two different words in English to translate what is in uh, both Greek and Hebrew, only one word. The word for breath or wind in Greek is pneuma. In Hebrew, it's ruach. But both stand also for spirit. So there's an analogy uh, given here by Jesus between how the wind operates and, how the, and the way the Spirit of God operates. And what is, he is saying is that the Spirit, like the wind, is entirely beyond both the control and the comprehension of man. Here we are in the year 2021. Well, we've made great strides in meteorology. Uh, we still hear our weather forecasters talk about how old Mother Nature has fooled us. We thought it was going to blow that way, but instead it blew the other way. We thought it was coming in, instead it stayed up there. Some of you don't watch the weather. <laughs> watch the weather sometime. It's a good laugh. But <laughs> what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus was that the movement of the Spirit in giving new birth to sinners is entirely in the sovereign will of God. Just as in Ezekiel 37, where the Spirit of God suddenly moves to give flesh to dry bones, so the operation of the wind is a parable of the same thing. The wind does as it pleases, 
so does the Spirit. Its operation is sovereign and beyond our faulty reasoning. And that was the lesson that the teacher of Israel needed to hear more than anything else. He who had come to believe that a sinful person could control the circumstances of rightful entry into the kingdom of God by his own pitiful moralism. Nicodemus should have known. Instead, he wondered aloud in verse 9, how can these things be? How wonderful to think that he eventually found out. Well, this is a magnificent expression of the grace of God in the new birth, that we who are completely unable and unwilling even to do a single thing to put us in a right standing with God have yet been given new life through Christ by the regeneration that has come upon us solely by the sovereign good will of the Lord. And you might ask, is there anything we can do? When we think of unsaved friends and family members, uh, some who care not a whit about whether there is a holy God who will one day sit in judgment upon them or uh, others who falsely believe that their good works will earn enough favor with God that he'll compromise his own nature and somehow figure a way to squeeze them into the kingdom. Is there anything that we can do? And of course the answer is yes. We can pray for them. Uh, God hears our prayers. And the sovereign God who directs his spirit wherever he wills loves to direct it in providence according to the petitions of his people, of his beloved. But the lesson from our text this morning is the Lord Jesus' lesson to Nicodemus. I say to you, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There may be some here this morning who are thinking, uh, how can I hope to repent of my sins and believe in Jesus if I have no natural ability uh, to do it? And the answer is to look to him. Confess your sin to him. Search for him in the Bible. Go to church and, and hear him speak. Choose a different company of people for your associates. Ask him to change your cold heart and, and give you a believing one. Humble yourself before him and, and look to him as best as you can. God loves the penitent sinner. Make that your posture and see God breathe into your life the life of the Spirit. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Salvation is of the Lord how could we ever desire it any other way? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful picture of how you save us. Thank you for uh, the lessons that we learn here that uh, reinforce uh, our knowledge that, that we're sinners unable to do anything to uh, be just before you. And, we, we're so grateful, uh, all of us who have believed and, and belong to you, and we have entered into your kingdom. And we, we, we give our, all of our praise, thanksgiving, and honor to you for, for that. And we pray for those, Lord, that have, have not done that. They're still in their sins. Uh, they think that uh, by being you know, good people, uh, that perhaps uh, you'll wink and and let them in. Lord, we'll pr we pray that you'll rebuild their sinfulness to them and your glory to them and that you'd give them a life in your spirit. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll gather in 10 minutes for the observance of the Lord's Supper. Let me pronounce a, a benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord uh, make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord Lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.